Welcome to um, CEU Executive MBA's Munich Online Open Day. I'm Thomas Lammel, CEU Executive MBA's Senior Program Manager, and I will guide you through this evening. So let's start with the program presentation with Yusuf Akbar. Uh, Yusuf Akbar is CEU EMBA Faculty Co-Director and Associate Professor of Strategy. He published over 40 journal articles, four books, and numerous contributions to academic and professional research in strategy and international business. He's founding editor of the International Journal of Emerging Markets and an advisor to governmental authorities. His consulting and professional reference includes Citibank, Deutsche Telekom, Siemens, Texas Instruments, and Toyota. Uh, thank you, Yusuf, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Thomas. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us here online. Um, I'd just like to walk uh, walk you through uh, the CEU Executive MBA program um, and uh, present some key features, uh, some innovations, and some distinctiveness of the program, as well as give you some background into the thinking behind the uh, architecture and development of the program itself. Um, as I say, it will probably make sense if we if we have a, have a Q and A, I guess, after the presentation, and then we can we can field questions. Next slide, please. So, you know, as a strategy professor, you know, one one of the things that I think we're all we're all coming very quickly to the realization is is that many of the traditional rules of business strategy, which you know persisted for the best part of half a century. Um, more or less came to an end at the turn of uh, turn of this century, um, you know, and I think that what we're seeing is dramatic shifts in digital transformation, uh, the emergence of entirely new ways of thinking about organizational forms, particularly strategic agility, um, the growth of ecosystems as being sources of competitive advantage, and so on, as well as I think, you know, without question, a world which is becoming increasingly difficult to predict. So since 2008, we've had the biggest financial crisis in recorded history. We've had the largest um, migration uh, it, refugee crisis in Europe since World War Two. And now we're going through the biggest pandemic for a century. So I think all of I think all of these uh, factors are basically, you know, posing some fundamental questions about what is manager education and what is the uh, development of education. Next slide. And so I think, you know, a big question that we we have today is, you know, is this product which was developed um, a long time ago, uh, at least half a century ago, called the MBA, you know, is it still worth it given the changes in technology that we have today, given the the availability of online learnings uh, at a at an extent which we've, 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 we've never seen in human history. And I think one of the things that I'd like to do this evening with you is to help you understand why, in fact, the CEU Executive MBA is still very much worth it uh, and how we're responding uh, to the new challenges that we face. Next slide, please. So, you know, I think if, 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 you, if you look at a, 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 an MBA which is city-based, so you think about MBAs in the city of Munich, for example, or MBAs in the city of Vienna or, and so forth, uh, typically, uh, this is what they look like, you know, so they have a fairly standard MBA curriculum, which takes you through the kind of the, the classic classes, finance, econ, marketing, strategy, operations management, and so on. Um, most of the time for executive MBAs, uh, since often they're, they're kind of weekend uh, weekend programs, you have mainly local faculty that come in uh, uh, to teach, teach class. While you have a contingent of international students in the class, they are always, you know, a relatively small number, maximum one fifth of the cohort will be international. Um, you can pay up to 80,000 euros in tuition plus the expenses of getting there. And of course, you know, because it's a, a part time or often weekend program, uh, there's no work interruption. Now, you, you, you can contrast that with the top business schools in the world, the ones that you see in the Financial Times rankings. And it's a very different story. Uh, very often, they're full-time MBAs, right? So you have to take at least one year out of the job market uh, to study. You know, if you have a family and children, you, you may have to consider family relocation. And of course, you know, the cost is 120,000 euros plus. Um, now, what do you get for, for that kind of investment? 
you know, you, you will get access to uh, top-notch campus uh, experience. Um, you're going to have great faculty with, you know, excellent credentials, both in terms of their academic credentials, but also their uh, engagement with industry. Um, of course, because it's a full-time program and people are flying in to that place for at least a year, the student body is typically more international than what you'd get in a city-based weekend or part-time program. And very often the leading business schools are distinctive because they go out of their way to be mission driven and highly differentiated. And this is where we believe the CEU executive MBA kind of bridges these two, uh, these, these two programs because we believe that the CEU executive MBA offers the best of both worlds. We offer a level of affordability and I'll explain later why that's possible, uh, a level of affordability which is unrivaled in the market. Uh, 25,000 euros tuition. Um, because we are a modular program, by modular, we that means we have the participants flying in or coming in for short, intense periods and going away again. Again, I'll speak more to that as we go through the presentation. Um, we, we can also uh, attract uh, more international participants because they, you know, it's, you don't have to go to, uh, to business school uh, for 36 weekends uh, over two years, uh, you come in for 10 modules, which I'll explain later on. Um, you will have access to world-class campus facilities, both in our campus in Vienna and our campus in Budapest. Uh, the photo you can see there is uh, the Budapest campus. And as, as you'll see momentarily, uh, we can also compete with the top business schools in the world with some of the most uh, informed and influential faculties in their field. Um, on our campus, on our faculty roster. Next slide, please. I'll give you one example, um, Professor Mark Kaufman, um, who's a leading thinker in behavioral economics. And he'll, he leads our, uh, our course in microeconomics and will help you understand the, the latest, most influential uh, thinking around how microeconomics can explain business behavior. We have Professor Joy Chan, who's one of the most accomplished practitioner uh, faculty that we have, who everyone says year after year without question that she helps people who don't have a particular strong knowledge of finance to both be comfortable with finance, but also incredibly relevant at the same time. Um, at CEU, we have probably the best uh, faculty in data analytics in Europe. And uh, Miklos Koren is uh, one of our, uh, our stars, um, publishes widely, one of the most influential thinkers in his field. Uh, in finance, we have Professor Adam Zawadowski from, uh, with a PhD from Princeton, uh, who does a fantastic job of helping, helping us understand how uh, financial models help uh, decision making in a strategic context. And we have Professor Michael Labelle, who's the Jean Monnet Chair in, in, in Energy Innovation Studies, who really gives an outstanding uh, contribution in our entrepreneurship and innovation course, focusing on renewables and green transportation. But in addition to that, we have outstanding uh, visiting faculty, professors from Stanford, Columbia, Michigan, Berkeley, and University of Zurich. So we combine both our in-house expertise with some of the best people from around the world who come in to teach classes. Next slide, please. So this is what the program structure looks like. It's a, it's a modular structure where we have 10 modules. Some of our modules are nine days in length, as you can see on the slide. So for example, our big picture module, the first module we'll be taking with us is a nine day module. All of our summer modules in Budapest are nine day modules where we have a combination of core classes, our a signature leadership program and electives. And the remainder of our modules are four day modules. When you, you come in on a Thursday and you leave on a Sunday, we very much look at those modules as being much more concentrated, much more business-like uh, where, where, you, where you take your classes. And I think I want to emphasize two things to you here. The dates that you see on the screen in front of you are fixed. They will not change. Uh, many of our competitors particularly weekend programs will often move dates around uh, and they will have less flexibility with that. Uh, another very important strength of our program is that the modularity uh, allows you to plan uh, your study, work and family obligations much more effectively. And one of the things we do is we give you uh, pre-course um, work 
leading you into the module. You have a very intense experience during the module, and then we will give you post-course uh, uh, work to do, which will help you uh, build on what you've gathered um, during the program itself. Next slide, please. CEU is very proud to say that we have alumni in more than 100 countries around the world. And this is one of the very important things that we have at CEU, that you will find a CEU alumnus uh, all over the world, which will significantly improve your ability to network um, after graduation. And the alumni network is very active. We have many countries with alumni chapters. They organize events on a frequent basis. And as a graduate of CEU, you will get full access to all of the alumni and career services offered by CEU after graduation. Next slide, please. So this brings us to how can we do this? You know, how can we deliver a world-class program at 25,000 euros with an alumni network in more than 100 countries around the world? Well, we can do this because our university has an incredibly influential uh, and powerful um, supporter in George Soros. And the key mission of our university, which I mentioned in, in the slide before, is the open society. I'm going to say a little bit more what that actually means in terms of the learning experience. But just to give you a flavor, we were founded in 1991 by George Soros. Uh, we have students from 123 countries, faculty from 50 countries alumni, as I said, from more than 140 plus countries. And we have an endowment uh, of more than a billion euros, which actually is the highest endowment per student in Europe. Um, and in addition to that, uh, Mr. Soros has also created an open society university network with seed funding of $1 billion um, in addition. As a university, we are different from traditional standalone business schools in the sense that not only do we have top-notch business and management faculty, we can also call upon the expertise of thinkers from across disciplines, humanities and social sciences. So at the CEU Executive MBA, you will not just get the great management faculty that we're proud of, you'll also get to hear innovative, groundbreaking ideas from thought leaders across a multiple range of disciplines. So what does the EMBA for the open world mean, which is our, our vision? It means the following. We don't believe in particular dogmas, hierarchies, and privileges. In fact, the whole essence of the open society is to question those dogmas, hierarchies, and privileges. Um, and unlike some of the populism that we witness in the world today, we believe in radical rationality. We believe that every idea from the left, from the center, from the right, should be challenged. Um, we believe in facts and arguments rather than narratives. And I think it's fair to say that in the political space in recent years, maybe perhaps until the recent pandemic, which is another interesting discussion perhaps for another day, um, that narratives have dominated uh, public discussion. We believe that the, the way forward for society is to focus on facts and arguments, which is why we have a very strong emphasis in the curriculum on fact-based decision-making. Um, we're also fundamental believers in diversity and we fight against prejudice. And one of the things you'll find about the diversity of the executive MBA cohort is we have people from all over the world, across sectors, public, not-for-profit, private sector, gender diversity. And it's something that we're very, very proud of. And we believe through the generosity of, the, of Mr. Soros's support for our program, we can offer access to this program at a much more affordable 25,000 euros. Um, and I think on a final note, I think we, we think about our participants as having two very important qualities, that our participants both take individual and organizational responsibility in the decisions that they make. And we believe that you're not just there to do a job, you're actually there in your organization to make a positive change for society. Now, what does the classroom experience look like? Because after all, that's a very important feature of our program. Um, our current cohort features 65 managers with an average age of 14 years of work experience, which includes a minimum, and I emphasize that a minimum of three years leadership experience. In fact, many of our participants have significantly more than just three years. Um, because our program is modular, it's a highly intense immersive experience. You can see in the photograph here, one of our uh, top notch state of the art uh, classrooms that we use in the in the Harvard uh, classroom style. 
And what we try to do is we try to combine strategic level decision making with leadership training in our signature CEU leadership program. And our teaching methodologies are varied. Of course, we use interactive case-based instruction, but we also focus on uh, new technologies and new methodologies uh, for making decisions across all disciplines, finance, econ, marketing, uh, business and politics, political economy, innovation, and entrepreneurship. So um, the tuition is 25,000 euros, and that's for the entire program. So that includes all 10 modules. Uh, we've negotiated uh, special rates at our partner hotels based in Vienna and Budapest for all different uh, price categories from upscale to more affordable options. And we've also negotiated discounts for flights with Austrian Airlines and Lufthansa Group that can bring you uh, to Vienna from your destination. So um, we want you to join us, to join the open world. I, I, I'll draw your attention to two important dates. Uh, we have a 7% tuition discount, um, which is applicable if you apply uh, completely by the end of this month. And the final deadline for applications to the program are March 21st, 2021. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Yusuf. Um, it's one thing to hear about the program from, from us, but it's better to hear from people who have actually done it. I'd like to invite Christoph, an alum of CEU, MBA, and Aline, a current participant, to tell us their story. Christoph Madea is senior associate and manager at Deloitte. He's a member of the CEU MBA class of 2010, and he's online. He joined us for tonight. Hello, Christoph. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for, for inviting me uh, to this event. And it's, uh, it's really good to see uh, the one or other of you, at least uh, virtually here. Yeah? Um, yeah, my name is uh, Christoph Madea. I'm, I'm based in, in Munich. Uh, I work with uh, Deloitte in the M&A advisory team since 2011. Um, yeah, we are focused here particularly on, on cross-border uh, transactions, um, both on the buy and sell side, um, mainly for the, for the mid-cap uh, segment. And um, yeah, I think... Uh, the MBA at, at CU, um, yeah, very much contributed uh, to, to be successful in my work here um, at Deloitte. Um, maybe not only on a, on a professional side, but uh, also on, on a personal side. Um, yeah, maybe uh, to, to focus a bit on... Uh, on the on the professional side, I mean, we are we are working here every day uh, in an international uh, context, um, and uh, I mean, looking back at my my time at at CU, uh, this was such a diverse group of uh, of, of students, and um, it it really helped uh, starting at Deloitte um, to have this this intercultural. Uh, understanding um, when when joining here. Christoph, can we go back to the start and, you know, um, why won't you tell us why in the first place you chose CEU over other programs? The, the value of, of the program or I mean um, what you what you basically uh, get for your for your money and I was not in a, in a situation of easily spending 100,000 K uh, that might be necessary for uh, for a full time uh, MBA program uh, in the US, um, and uh, yeah, I mean having the chance to to study at at, at CU um, at that time in in Budapest uh, was was an affordable um, solution for me, and um, yeah, provided basically everything I I needed. Uh, um, to, to, to get the right skill set entering into, into the M&A um, um, arena. Uh, thank you, Christoph. I would like to um, move on to uh, Aline, who is a, uh, speaking of a current participant of the class of 2022. He joined in 2020, in, in 2020 this year. He's working with uh, Lufthansa Group, Austrian Airlines, and he's a strategic business intelligence and analytics lead. 
Um, hi, Aline, would you like to introduce yourself to um, our visitors, to our guests? Yes, of course, Thomas. Thank you for, for the uh, introduction. I, I may welcome everybody else as well. Uh, so good evening from my side. I'm very happy to be part of, of this to, this evening and, and hope to um, provide you um, some, some, some impressions of, of um, the current um, uh, MBA class cohort and how we have been doing so far. Um, can you talk about the diversity in class, not just um, yeah. to gender diversity, but yeah. also uh, nationalities and social backgrounds and industry yeah. backgrounds? Yeah, of course. I mean, finance guy, I mean, I worked for several banks for years. So, so the thing is, um, those under Caucasian financial guys or um, uh, mates from cohort are pretty much on the, you know, controlling and natural financing side. So we have a very good exchange there because they are lacking exactly of what I have. So, so that's why um, it is a good exchange of ideas or, or um, even, even pretty, much, pretty often within um, a cooperational project or projects we do together. It's, you it's learn a head start from very often. Just from your, cover. Sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you. You're, you're, yeah. you're learning from your classmates um, too, not just from your faculty, right? Of course, of course. I mean, there, as I said, that was the major um, criteria or major decision-making um, uh, point for me that I expected um, this as well, right? So what I'm uh, you know, looking into right now or where I'm getting some additional on top of the study uh, is, is the exchange, idea exchange and idea sharing or creating new ideas uh, within the cohort. It's, it's a very good culture uh, where we are practicing this. Yes, of course. And um, I mean, at the end of the day, I think um, the class is pretty much diverse from my feeling so far because I've studied um, masters at, at, at uh, Technical University Vienna and it, it was a joint study um, uh, at the U Waterford University as well. So I, 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 I know the in international environment. I've been traveling and working a lot within Europe and beyond so, but nevertheless, I, 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 I was, not even expecting that kind of diversity because we have people from rural, I, I would now call, call it like that, areas of the world uh, where, where everything is not going so smooth, such as uh, de developed countries um, who are working in NGOs. So that's a exact area of um, expertise I'm getting like additionally, I was not expecting this. So uh, we have uh, people from India, we have people from um, um, beyond European borders within, within um, Russian Federation and so on. So um, it is quite diverse in terms of, um, um, I, I would say, um, nationalities, of course. Um, but um, from my point of view, the most uh, of diversity is actually existing on area of working, right? On, on you know, fields of uh, working or, or um, even industries where people come from. Yeah? And, Nevertheless, as, as you can see me, I'm, I'm, I'm a um, dark-skinned Austrian, they call myself uh, sometimes. In Germany, I'm, I'm the Austrian guy, by the way. So they um, live up or uh, look up to me and say, you tell me how Austrians are thinking at Austrian Airlines or somewhere. So I adapt myself as well to, to, the, <laughs> uh, to, to, to the environment. And I have been meeting um, or I met actually people of, of this kind who are actually not you know, fitting in a box or in a specific, uh, you know, uh, criteria, uh, criteria, um, I would say agenda, but pretty much very open to the world, very, very, um, very, um, yeah, I would say experienced and as well uh, diverse. Yeah. Well, I mean, we are, according to the Times Higher Education, we're the second most international university in the world. So sometimes, for sure. yeah. I, mm -hmm. sometimes I happen to take this diversity for granted because we have this international class with a current cohort of uh, people coming from five continents, despite the Corona crisis, as you mentioned, we've, we've ha we have people from Australia, from India, from, from the US, from Egypt, Georgia, Russia, and uh, uh, the CEE region and Western Europe. Um, but diversity for us is not only being reflected when it comes to nationalities, but also to social backgrounds. And um, you, you already mentioned it, um, we have people, not just, you know, finance people, that's just a minority in the program who have actually a finance background, but we have people from NGOs, from human rights activism, from environmental um, organizations, from 
corporate, from traditional corporates, from um, engineering, technical background. So there's real, uh, there's a real social uh, diversity going on in your cohort. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. And, uh, and yeah, please go ahead. Maybe uh, just just an addition to the whole, um, I mean, Q and A session. I, I think it helped us as well as a cohort to grow together within these times where everybody is actually every sector is going through such crisis and and I, I literally felt how in the, in through our, um, in our um, summer module how everybody was uh, you know keen to know what's going on on in the other sector and and it, it was as it is as well very well working on a personal level not on like professional level where we are exchanging ideas and, and doing our projects together, learning together. That's like the major component of course, but nevertheless, it, it, it lives up as well to, to the ideas of, of I think um, open world or open society um, to its fullest on a, on a personal level as well. Perfect. Thank you, Aline, for sharing your story. Um, thank you very much. I will now pass the baton to our faculty, to our second faculty co-director, Professor Kieślowski to give a research presentation on entrepreneurs and governments a love-hate relationship. He will highlight our world-class research faculty that brings cutting edge managerial thinking to our classrooms and really sets us apart from other MBA programs in the region. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Maciej Kieślowski to you. He's the second executive MBA faculty co-director and associate professor of law and public management. He's got a JSD uh, degree from Yale. He's got an MPA um, degree from Princeton and an MBA from Yale. He's advised to governments, international organizations, and businesses dealing with political, regulatory, and compliance issues. And his book, Administrative Strategy, was translated in five languages. Please, Maciej, you've got the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas. Um, so we will, uh, Joseph mentioned in his presentation that at CEU, we, um, we really want you to make decisions based on facts, not narratives. Um, but that doesn't mean you don't need to take narratives into account as, as, social, as part of an important social context, but you shouldn't believe narratives too much. And my uh, presentation today is precisely about a certain narrative uh, that uh, has been gaining ground in continental Europe. Um, uh, and, it, uh, and, and, and it relates to entrepreneurship and and the whole ecosystem of startups and small and medium-sized enterprises. I call this narrative the loft narrative. Yes, the, the idea that European governments and European politicians go out of their way to say how supportive they are of uh, the uh, entrepreneurial sector. E EU's recently published SME strategy calls the uh, small and medium-sized enterprises the backbone of the European economy. Mm, uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel uh, in 2015 in Munich actually mentioned that, that uh, you know, we sometimes don't fully appreciate how important is this political support and, and framework that is given to entrepreneurs. Um, so so this, is, this is very uh, strong. Um, this is very influential, this, this, this love uh, towards entrepreneurship from European politicians, but there are also facts. There are also brutal facts on the ground, um, which look like this uh, scared uh, men uh, surrounded by bureaucracy. If you look at uh, World Bank's doing business rank, which is the most uh, um, authoritative index of um, bureaucratic barriers that are faced by uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, you can see a picture which is very different from the love uh, narratives. You, you, you see a picture in which among the 30 most business friendly countries, you have some expectable Anglo-American uh, economies, New Zealand, US, UK is there. You have some, uh, you have a fair bit of, all, of virtually all Scandinavian countries, 
Um, and the Baltic states that kind of pattern themselves after the Scandinavian countries. You have some uh, um, uh, kind of breakaway countries like Georgia is very famous for its, uh, for its uh, business friendly climate and some Asian countries who are uh, doing the same thing. But in terms of continental Europe, where uh, you know CU is located, not only Eastern Europe but Western continental Europe, the 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 the, the top country, the most business friendly country in this category is actually Germany, and it's only twenty second. And uh, the next one, twenty seventh, is actually Austria. So you know, between Munich and Vienna, we uh, we can claim the lead, but it's you know. It's still the lead in the, you know, in 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 the third, uh, uh, you know, between in 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 the uh, uh, in the third tenth of the uh, of the of the of the global business friendliness. So, you know, we have this uh, uh, at the back of our heads that continental Europe is kind of sluggish and bureaucratic. And the love that I mentioned before is often uh, used as an impetus to change it, to make us more competitive, a little more like the Anglo-American uh, uh, Anglo uh, economies. What is happening lately over the last few years, and what I want to focus on today in my short presentation, is another narrative that is uh, looking at the same data, but from a different perspective. It's a narrative that says, no, we actually don't need to become like America, like you know, New Zealand, like the UK, in a sort of being overly supportive to entrepreneurs. And to give you an example of this, uh, of this new influential voices that are skeptical of entrepreneurship, let me point to perhaps the most influential current economist, French economist, Thomas Piketty. Uh, this year, he published a book where he says very bluntly that the discourse of entrepreneurship, uh, in his view, see, uh, serves primarily as the way for winners to justify whatever uh, level of inequality uh, you can uh, justify it and have this kind of sense of moral superiority. If entrepreneurship is supported, those people who are not making it, uh, are not becoming the new Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, are, are kind of uh, you know, responsible for their own fate. A similar uh, mm, uh, uh, view was uh, mm, uh, shared in another very influential a recent book by Mariana Mazzucato, uh, who is uh, uh, in London, but she's an Italian economist, um, where she uh, basically focuses more on data and evidence. And she says, you know, uh, there is so much talk about small firms creating jobs, but actually when you look at the data, she calls it mainly a myth. That, uh, um, that, that SMEs are this engine of growth. As, uh, by definition, she points out, small firms will create jobs, but they will also destroy a lot of jobs when they go out of business. Uh, so again, uh, this sort of, the last few decades of this public and question support to entrepreneurship in Europe is suddenly being challenged by some influential voices. I want to mention, uh, kind of on the side, that um, this discussion is not entirely new. Actually, you know, we are an uh, Austrian university, an American as well, uh, but uh, a famous Austrian-American economist, probably the most famous of the 20th century, Joseph Schumpeter, actually encapsulated uh, in his writings this, this, uh, this question, entrepreneurship, good or bad. Uh, most of you may know that uh, who, uh, those of you who are listening and who are in the field of entrepreneurship may have, uh, have heard the term creative destruction, the idea that you know, small entrepreneurial companies really um, uh, sort of push the frontier for forward by destroying some old uh, habits. 
uh, and, and industry practices. This is indeed uh, Schumpeter's idea from his uh, 1911, more than 100 years now, uh, book. But interestingly, the same uh, Joseph Schumpeter actually offered an alternative view that maybe in his 1942 book, he actually said that maybe uh, the, the world operates more on the basis of creative accumulation, large businesses being better managed, having more resources, uh, better structures are the, the drivers of innovation as opposed to small ones. And interestingly, uh, you know, empirical studies, numerous have been made to, uh, to confirm proof or disprove what is what we call Schumpeter one hypothesis and Schumpeter two hypothesis. Uh, and actually there is some empirical support for both. Uh, it is unresolved issue. I mean, and uh, you know, and uh, that uh, comes, that, that is, that is uh, very much true on all other aspects of this, um, you know, entrepreneurial narrative when you actually confront it with, with, with facts and data. Um, firm size and productivity. Are smaller firms more productive or are larger firms more productive? Well, so there are some studies that say, that show that uh, SMEs are less productive than big businesses because they are not as well managed and they, uh, uh, you, you know, don't have all those scale economy that is that is helping in productivity. Some uh, point out that SMEs are more productive because of uh, their greater flexibility. There is pretty strong evidence, however, that SMEs do not, uh, um, uh, are not responsible for most of employment growth. So they are not better in growing employment, kind of because of the logic that Mariana Mazzucato, I already mentioned, um, they create jobs, but they also destroy jobs. You also need to think about big businesses creating a lot of jobs. If you are Amazon, you are creating tons of jobs. Uh, so that's by comparison. Family firms performance, actually slightly better if you are large and public than when you are small and not on the stock exchange. Um, and also there is quite good evidence that this sort of policies that support small companies, for example, the French rules that exempt uh, um, uh, companies that have fewer than 50 employers uh, are actually harming workers and introduce major distortion. So that is all the evidence before COVID. Now there is, uh, you know, a lot of new evidence coming after the pandemic or during the pandemic. And, and it's not pretty for entrepreneurship as well, to be honest. Uh, you know, SMEs in, in the US uh, employ 45% of workers, but are responsible for 62% of losses. Uh, also, you know, if you compare mid-sized firms with very small firms, less than 20 employees, uh, actually uh, um, significantly, uh, significant correlation between the size and, and the healthiness of a business, kind of robustness to this extraordinary shock. Uh, very important for Piketty's hypothesis. Remember, Piketty said uh, in his newest book that entrepreneurship is just a mirage that, should, that justifies, you know, supposed inequalities that we are facing, actually actual inequalities that we are facing, that's objective, but, but supposedly uh, gives people a kind of an easy way to climb the social ladder. Actually, if you look at the data, SMEs uh, owned by African-Americans and immigrants uh, experience largest losses in the US. Women owned businesses in Canada fire disproportionately more workers. So that kind of seems to confirm the hypothesis that like we give people this hope, but the structure of inequalities and, uh, and, uh, and, and privileges and discrimination uh, stays whether you become an entrepreneur or not. And then the policy responses, US Paycheck Protection Program was very heavily criticized for the lack of correlation with um, with, uh, with actual needs. Um, the Kurzarbeit uh, program, by, by, by contrast, is praised, uh, but mostly because it's automatic, yes? The, the idea of, 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 of subsidizing 
decreased uh, work hours uh, by, 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 by German workers. Um, it's also an unprecedentedly expensive program. Uh, actually, Olaf Scholz, the uh, federal minister, uh, called it the German bazooka uh, because it, it is so much more uh, uh, costly than anything else that's been done in Europe. But you know, one thing that OECD uh, tells us uh, for all those countries, even Germany, is that we focus a lot on short-term fixes, but there is not enough talk about structural changes, like kind of preparing the small businesses to the new normal. And uh, the question is whether that again is 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 a feature, not a bug. That it's simply very difficult for some of those small. Uh, size uh, um, companies to to actually reorient in response to a shock like this. So I want to give you one case before I wrap up, and I hope to have a lot of uh, you know um, challenging uh, uh, discussions and questions to these provocative statements here. Um, you know to show you how this kind of pro entrepreneurial narrative is 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 playing out and. Kind of distorting our view of reality. Um, so um, a lot of you know about the famous Beyond, now famous BioNTech Pfizer uh, vaccine, uh, which has this spectacular uh, e effectiveness was recently announced, and uh, a lot of international media. For for those of you who are in Germany, of course, you probably heard about BioNTech, but a lot of people outside learn about BioNTech through this amazingly, uh, you know, overhyped uh, media coverage, like the uh, cover of the uh, of the New York Times interview with uh, Dr. Sakin and Dr. Turecci, um, uh, this narrative about those uh, immigrants from uh, our children of Turkish immigrants coming and building this startup um, and, uh, uh, and 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 creating this world saving vaccine. All of this is, by the way, true. What I want to invite everybody is to contrast it with the narrative that almost simultaneously emerged about uh, the uh, CEO of BioNTech's corporate pa partner, Pfizer. So CEO of Pfizer, Dr. Albert Burla, was mentioned almost at the same time in a very different context. This NPR website, believe it or not, it was actually under the investigations section. And there was there was this 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 strong uh, coverage and critical coverage of uh, of Dr. Burla in the context of him selling his uh, stock uh, that he had as part of his compensation as a CEO of Pfizer um, uh, on the day when the vaccine effectiveness was announced. And you know what was missed in this coverage, this critical coverage uh, of him. Uh, was that he's also an immigrant, he's a Greek immigrant, that he's also a medical doctor, not some sort of corporate executive. He wor worked for Pfizer for 25, seven years, um, including as global vaccine chief. But like, even if you compare those two photos, yes, you have this, uh, you know, charis charismatic couple in, you know, casual clothes. They are just like you and me. And you have this corporate executive in a suit uh, presumably responding to some uh, hard questions in some testimony in the US Congress. Now, uh, um, what wasn't mentioned that on the headlines at least, maybe somewhere in the fine print, was that Dr. Burla's uh, 5.6 million stock uh, sales were actually approved months before in August as part of a predetermined plan, which this is basically how we want executives to be compensated. We don't want them to be able to decide on the slot and be able to manipulate uh, the news. Uh, we want them to uh, uh, set a price at which they want uh, they are willing to sell and have a long-term plan. And that was exactly what Dr. Bula done. There is no uh, evidence of impropriety. The, the most interesting part that was missing in these narratives, again, coming back to Joseph's point about narratives, is that during the very same week that Dr. Burla sold 5.6 million uh, of the shares of, of, of Pfizer, 
Um, Dr. Sahin earned half a billion uh, dollars in uh, appreciated value of his BioNTech uh, stock, uh, 90 times more than Dr. Burla. Yes, and, and, and you know, I'm leaving aside whether you know, somebody who leads an organization, they are not doing it them by themselves, but who leads an organization that is saving humanity from the pandemic should be a multi-billionaire. That's a philosophical question. What I am uh, pointing out is that, you know, the narrative of, you know, our love of ordinary people in the startups versus the corporate, uh, uh, you know, sharks of big business, it's uh, sometimes very heavily distorted. It's very clear that both BioNTech and Pfizer were needed for this partnership. BioNTech had this research in the vaccine, but it needed the Pfizer structure for massive tests and regulatory approvals, and surely now for the distribution. All of this is missed when we kind of uncritically uh, choose entrepreneurship as a gold standard and big business as this, you know, questionable, suspicious, corrupt uh, mm, uh, part of the of the business community. Uh, so take away about entrepreneurship, whether you agreed with me or not. And I mostly was uh, my goal was mostly not to tell you what I think, but what is the evolving discussion about entrepreneurship in Europe. Uh, mm, Clearly, there is no policy consensus on entrepreneurship. So policies can change in the future. There can be, uh, you know, a, a, a change in this love relationship that has that has been the case for the last few decades. Uh, the, our, uh, you know, policy views, our political narratives about entrepreneurship can become more critical. Uh, and there is also an objective reality that if we are living in the increasingly uncertain world, the question is, what is the role of entrepreneurial opportunities if small, medium-sized enterprises are kind of more, uh, um, uh, more, vol more, more susceptible to those, to those shocks than big businesses? Will they be able to attract talent? Will they be able to uh, you know, get good people who will take the, the chance in the ever more uncertain world to leave their corporate jobs and, and, and work for smaller, for smaller ventures. Now, what is the takeaway for, for you? And this is, you know, almost the last word for me. Uh, you know, I, I think that the policies, pro-entrepreneurial policies are not going to impact BioNTech of this world. If you have a new idea for the world saving vaccine, whether you have tax incentives or comes of regulatory incentives uh, at the start doesn't matter. You will find money and support to have your idea uh, um, developed. The, the real impact of those pro-entrepreneurial policies, uh, policies are probably mostly on those other less obvious uh, ideas. Yes, and, and if you are, developing a new world saving vaccine or a new world saving drug i think you you know uh, you are in a special category you know you will be fine in terms of, of of developing your venture if you are in this kind of middle category you are developing a very cool new you know a candle flavor made of bamboo you know then you need to be quite critical about your self critical about your business idea and 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 there is this emerging tool which we teach in CU executive mba that's called scenario planning and and you need to think about can my startup survive without governmental uh, help if the policies do change or can my startup survive during another crisis so scenario planning is is one way to deal with it can you respond proactively in your business environment? This is my forthcoming paper with, with Yosef, that businesses are often very passive in face of changing regulatory environment. Whether you can be active depends on your social network, on, on the type of, 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 of regulatory environment in your country. Again, take a critical view at your idea uh, and, also consider intrapreneurial options. Yes, the, the options to, 
uh, develop new ideas within larger organizations, including maybe an organization where you already work. That is a possibly possible um, uh, alternative to setting up something new. I hope uh, this was, uh, uh, you know, relatively interesting and thought provoking. And I think I think I think this kind of discussion we won't have much time, but um, but we would in a, in class we would have a half hour or hour long discussion, forty five minutes long discussion about a topic like this. I, I hope it shows you some things about uh, CEU uh, and our MBA, how we teach. Um, and what it means that we are an American university in Europe. Yes, I mean, I think most importantly, we give critical perspective. We don't preach, uh, you know, um, uh, automatically the latest American business practices. We are actually very critical to all business practices and want you uh, to, 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 to have this critical mindset as well. We want to help you understand the big picture, not only you know the, the your, your little thing, but the context. We offer a variety of voices. I I I show you the website, the homepage of our innovation lab, which is our own incubator in in Vienna and Budapest, and it will be it will have you know you will meet a lot of people there who will disagree with every single word. I've uttered during this presentation. And that's what a good university is about. A place where you can have a variety of choices and, and opinions, yes? Um, we want to focus on knowledge that's practically relevant. We always like get, give you the context, but get to what you should take out of this in your practical managerial life. Uh, we always think that good MBA is not only about how, but also about why. And we focus on this a lot. And we definitely always try to make you think. So thank you so much. And I'll be happy to uh, get some questions, comments, challenges. Um, I, I think we have another five, five four, seven minutes for this. Uh, thank you, Maciej, for your controversial um, lecture. Um, I would like to see some questions from, from the audience or even from Marlene from Werk uh, 1, who is, you know, in touch with, with entrepreneurs on a daily basis on if, if what her stand is on, on, on this, uh, on, on your presumptions. Yeah, well, um, luckily, um, we have almost um only digital startups here so i think they were kind of um, they weren't so affected by this crisis so um they have a digital business model so they can work remotely anyway and they can um also um the um communication with business partners um etc is is online most of the time and so they weren't they weren't affected by the crisis like other startups who um have a more B2C um, business model maybe. So I think we were really lucky. Of course, there were some who had some trouble at the beginning, but yeah, um, luckily they, could, they couldn't they could make it somehow. Um, about, um, I was, um, I have one question for um, Professor Kisilowski because you um, were talking about an uncertain world and I'm not sure if the world was certain ever. So I think it's part of, um, building a startup and, and having an idea and being creative um, before this um, presentation or before the, um, uh, this event, um, um, we already talked about, yeah, having also the possibility to be creative in a crisis. Um, great ideas always come from crisis or after crisis. And I think, um, I'm not sure if the world was ever really certain <laughs> I don't think so. And I think, um, yeah, I think that's maybe being a part of, um, of having a startup and, and starting an uh, own company. Um, yeah, to have an idea, to believe in it and to be, to be able to improve. And um, yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> no, I, 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 I agree with you. And I think, so I think, uh, I think clearly there will be, there is no question there will be room for innovation and entrepreneurial spirit, uh, regardless of, of the change. The question is whether, and you know, I don't even uh, uh, argue here who is right. I'm, I'm simply saying that, you know, there, uh, uh, as we saw with, you know, with Schumpeter, there's been waves of thinking about the role of enterprises, startups, in this process of uh, creating new ideas. And, and um, you know, sometimes we, because we look at only at, at the, our current narrative that is fed to us by the media or the politicians, we don't recognize that narratives can change. Yes, and they did change, yes. And, and the current climate in Europe is very pro-entrepreneurial in terms of message, yes. As I showed you in terms of reality, there is a lot to be done. But, you know, a conventional wisdom is that those things will have to be fixed because, you know, entrepreneurship is the only choice. And I wanted to show you that currently for the first time for, uh, you know, since a long, long time, maybe like 1960s or 1970s, you start getting very serious influential people who are saying, Actually, it's good that you know that we are not so pro-entrepreneurial. Yes, that it's that that this startup culture is creating a lot of problems uh, and a lot of inequalities. And I'm not even arguing whether they are right or wrong. But I think it's very important for an entrepreneur to not for, take for granted that for the next decade or two decades there will be this unquestioned change towards easier regulations, more support for SMEs, because it's not, it's not obvious, yes? Uh, American and Anglo-American uh, brand, kind of, uh, took a serious hit with Donald Trump, yes? I mean, it's no longer the case that everything American is super hot. And I am talking as a professor at an American university, yes? But, but uh, you know, as, uh, um, uh, uh, Donald Trump and, and his uh, political allies always say, actually, you know, liberal campuses in America are, are the big source of criticism of what happens in America. So we are kind of in line here at CEU. But, but um, my goal is to, for everybody to understand that it's not that obvious that we will have this strongly pro-entrepreneurial direction that we have now, it may change. Uh, so that, what, that, that that's the main takeaway. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Maciej, you have addressed the, the, the current crisis and I think it perfectly merges with a, questions from, a question from the audience from Milica, I hope I pronounced the, uh, the name correctly. She's, I want to, to, to move to the Q&A part, taking that question on the current crisis and move on to Yusuf to reply on that question. Milica wants to know, what is your plan regarding the spring module with the current COVID situation, meaning travel re restrictions, etc.? Will you go on, will you go with online lecturing or do you have other plans for organizing lectures? Um, will you also take any measures to help students who are currently in red zones to have uh, travel permissions needed to attend? And how strict is the three-year leadership rule and should we apply if we miss a couple of modules, uh, months? Yusuf? Thanks very much, Thomas. Um, so you've got three questions there. Um, so <clears throat> we, we've, we've been operating the program during the pandemic and the model that we use is a, is a hybrid model. So those participants who can actually get to Hungary or, or Budapest or Vienna uh, can come on campus I mean, we have we follow all public health requirements rigorously and completely. Um, those those who cannot, uh, we have state of the art technology in our classrooms to enable participants to take part um, online. Um, uh, it, it, it's pity Alan is not with us, but he he would confirm that um, it's remarkable the quality of the technology we have to enable people to participate um, when they're not 
not with us and it and it and it the technology is really good because it becomes a two-way thing it's not like a a passive participation online people can really get involved ask questions interact with the faculty and the participants very clearly so that's the so that's the answer to the answer to your first question i mean we even we organized uh, antigen rapid covid tests at the start of the modules as well to sort of you know um try to put people at ease as regards sort of uh, uh, potential infection risks um in in, in terms of um tr international travel uh, regrettably uh, we are we have very little control over over that question unfortunately um don't forget that the the first module that you will take with us should you join us in the program will be in may so hopefully by then the situation will you know six months away will hopefully be much better than it is now especially given the positive news now we have around the vaccines that are now emerging um my you know for what it's worth i i suspect that um travel restrictions will travel restrictions were the first things to be introduced and travel restrictions will be the last thing to be removed unfortunately but we we will do everything we can to ensure that if we can have you here with us on campus physically we will help you do that uh, we also would say that of course you know from a networking perspective it's it's uh, it's a lot better to be on campus but we understand that some people um can't make it and your third question unrelated to covid um you know we have this three-year leadership rule but we do uh we are interested in applications uh if you have you know, if you're if you're short of the three year and we look at every single application on a case-by-case -case basis i will emphasize that every single person who who gets shortlisted is interviewed um so we we really get to know everybody as, as well as we can and you know if we feel that there's a particular case to be made for someone who's making a real contribution who may not have the three-year um minimum requirement we 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 are more than happy to consider that as a as an exception as well thank you um the last question Militza added was um, will you um also take um sorry will you also take any measures to help students who are currently in red zones to have the travel permissions needed to attend um we're happy to provide any confirmation of participation or invitation to to the module but of course we cannot issue any like official um governmental um documents that's nothing we can provide we cannot issue visa we can we can invite you to the module we can issue a participation confirmation of course that usually um is enough to to do business trips it depends on the country you're coming from of course but we're doing our best to help you get to the program and we tried we're helping our all our participants to get to the module safe and sound um another question was about the admission process and the application process how does it take place uh, what from start to finish yeah from the point of application to acceptance so when someone's completed an application uh, we take a look at the required documentation to see whether or not the applicant has submitted the correct documentation. Where there are gaps in the documentation, we will request that that documentation is provided. Once the dossier is, is complete, uh, the candidate is then considered for an interview. So we look at the minimum entry criteria. We've just been discussing the leadership requirement, for example. And once they pass that, um, that criteria they're invited for an interview which is typically 45 minutes long where a faculty member will ask you uh, various questions related to your motivations for joining the program what you can contribute to the program which we think is extremely important um, as well as sort of um, issues around your experience participation in strategic projects in your um, in your organization your leadership style uh, and so on um, on the basis of that interview, a recommendation is made to the admissions committee. Um, the admissions committee then um, sends a recommendation to the president of the university. The president of the university takes a look at the recommendations and then a decision is made. And then finally, my colleague Thomas will um, uh, be able to send you a letter from the faculty co-directors, um, hopefully inviting you to join us in the program. Um, we try to make this as quick as possible. 
uh, it's a function of documentation as much as it is about us processing the, the documentation and organizing the interviews. Um, another question on the COVID situation. What are the measures currently in place um, at the university in order to ensure safety? CEU follows all official public health guidelines as regards uh, prevention of uh, COVID infection, which includes the wearing of masks, frequent hand washing, the maintenance of physical distance. Uh, our classrooms are set up to ensure that, that there is adequate physical distance between participants. And as I mentioned previously, we organize rapid COVID tests at the start of the modules to uh, increase everyone's sense of, um, of security uh, uh, about the modules. So we go beyond uh, the minimum requirements required by the public health authorities. We will continue to do that because we believe it's vitally important to the uh, success of our program. And the question, can I get a scholarship, which um, I might need to add that I'm not sure if you can get a scholarship, but you can apply for a scholarship because we have a variety of financial support at CEU you can apply for. We have um, three different kinds of, of financial support, basically. It's, the first one is the Open World Scholarship, which aims at people who have some kind of achievement in the humanitarian field or very interesting stories to add so they can um, apply for the um, competitive Open World Scholarship. We have a simple need-based scholarship, which is income-based. It takes into consideration your current income, depending on the country you're residing in. And we have uh, country-specific merit-based scholarships. We have those in place for regions or countries, for, for, et cetera. for example, in Germany, we have a social mobility fellowship. We have a fellowship, a scholarship in Austria in place. We uh, already have a, a scholarship for the Western Balkans, if you're from, from that region. Um, they depend on different target groups. So I think the best um, thing for you to do is to reach out to me and tell me something about your background and where you're resident at the moment. So I can happily advise you on the you know, financial support that we are able to give you. But in general, as a rule, we can say that we have a vast um, uh, uh, opportunity of scholarships available and we're happy to provide them to students who actually need them or deserve them. Um, the last question, looking at the time, would be about the uh, double degree. Um, what does it mean to have a US and EU accredited degree? Uh, very simple. Um, as an American university, we are fully accredited and licensed in the United States. So your degree is an American degree. And because we are an Austrian private university with the legal right to offer degrees in Austria, you also get an Austrian accredited diploma. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, if there are, are there any more questions from, from the audience, from the attendees? Please shoot them into uh, the chat box. If not, I would, rec I would strongly encourage you to get in touch with me directly. And uh, uh, let's take it from there. I'm happy to advise you. And don't forget about the early bird discount for our applications until the 30th of November and the application, the final application deadline of uh, March 21st. Thank you for your um, patience and your, uh, for coming here and have a nice evening.